Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on reputation. Last time, we looked at the chain store paradox. We saw that if there was a single challenger who entered the market, then the chain store has incentive to reveal whether it's weak or strong. If it's weak, it should concede to the challenger. If it's strong, it should declare a price war. But this changes entirely if there are multiple challengers out there and that first challenger enters the market. Now, if the chain store concedes, it signals weakness to all future challengers. Hey, I'm a chain store and I'm weak. You should enter the market. So a chain store that is weak might actually declare a price war, not because it is profitable to do so for that one interaction, but rather because the chain store wants to deter future challengers. And by deterring the future challengers, the chain store will make up for the cost of declaring the price war up front. Now, this actually has a neat application to civil wars. Rather than thinking about this as a challenger in a chain store in an economic relationship, let's think about a rebel group and a government bargaining in the shadow of a civil war. So if the rebel group is dissatisfied with the status quo, it could demand concessions out of the government. And if you're a government and you're only facing a single rebel group, then you have incentive to reveal whether you're weak or strong in that case. If you're weak, you should concede to the rebel group's demands and avoid the cost of war. But if you're strong, hey, you're strong. You don't have to give in to those rebels' demands. It's cheaper for you to fight. You're going to fight a war instead. Now, think about, in contrast, a situation with multiple rebel groups. Maybe you're the government of a country with 12 different ethnic groups scattered all across the country, and you are dealing with just a single rebel group now. Well, if you concede to the rebel group's demands in this first instance, what you're doing is really signing away your rights to be strong against the other ethnic groups in the country. If you give concessions to this first rebel group, then you're going to inspire other rebel groups to form and demand concessions out of you. And because you're still weak, you're going to be having to give those concessions up. So if you're a weak government and you have a first rebel group come and demand concessions out of you, you might actually want to fight. You might want to actually declare a war against that first rebel group because you know that by conceding, you're conceding a lot to everyone else. And by fighting, in contrast, you're not conceding to this first rebel group and you're not going to be conceding to the future rebel groups because hopefully they will be deterred by your strength in this first interaction. So this model actually has a couple of neat implications. First, We've seen in the past few lectures that incomplete information is a cause of war. And if that's true, if incomplete information is a cause of war, then if you have more potential rebel groups in a country, you should expect to see more war. These governments should be declaring war against these first rebel groups to acquire a reputation of strength in this presence of incomplete information. And similarly, the more potential rebel groups you see out there, the fewer concessions you'll see a government give. In contrast, if there are fewer potential rebel groups out there, the government is going to be more willing to give up concessions. So that's the theory. Does this actually hold in practice? The answer is yes. A political scientist from UC San Diego named Barbara Walter, that is Barbara Walter without an S, not Barbara Walters, the media personality, she looks at a data set. She collects data for a bunch of different governments and a bunch of different rebel groups, basically all of the governments and all the potential rebel groups in the world for a long time period. And she controls for other factors that might be important to whether a government gives concessions or not. And she finds by looking at this data set that indeed governments give fewer concessions when more potential rebel groups exist. These Governments are trying to acquire reputation by standing firm against these, these potential rebel groups because they don't want to incentivize other rebel groups to form and ask for more concessions. And she actually provides a couple of, of neat pieces of evidence to verify that, in fact, this is something that a government should do and a government might want to do because of the potential consequences if they don't. So first, she sees that if a government that gave concessions to a rebel group is out there, then it's going to be facing more challenges in the future. So if you give concessions to the first rebel group, you're going to see more challenges 59% of the time. In contrast, governments that resisted initially only saw challenges afterward 27% of the time. So there's a big difference in the amount of future challenges you see if you give up in the first place, whereas in contrast, if you declare strength and you say, no, I'm not going to give in to those concessions. Likewise, the more accommodation you give to a particular rebel group, the more challenges you should expect to see in the future. So if you give up no concessions to a particular rebel group to start off, then you see less than one challenge on average in the future from other potential rebel groups. 
In contrast, if you gave up territorial autonomy to that first rebel group, if you said, hey, rebel group, you're very popular in this particular region, I'm no longer going to administer this region, you're still going to be a part of my country, but I'm going to allow you to have your own functioning government there. Well, that is a bigger concession, obviously, than giving up no concessions. And we see that governments that do that actually see more challenges in the future. So now we're slightly above one challenge on average if you give up territorial autonomy. And in the worst case scenario, if you're a government, if you give up full independence to a challenger, to a rebel group, well, this is signaling that you're very weak. You're no longer saying, hey, you're still part of my country. I'll just allow you to administer this region. You're saying, it's okay. You can be your own country now. That is the biggest concession that you can give to a rebel group. And we actually see that a whole bunch of challenges occur after this. So we're basically doubling the number of challenges that we expect to receive, again, on average, from when you give up territorial autonomy to when you give up full independence to that rebel group. So we're seeing that if you're a government, you have lots of incentives to acquire reputation by rejecting the demands of a rebel group to just discourage future rebel groups from approaching you and ask for more concessions. So that is the argument why reputation might be the cause of conflict. And what we'll see in the next couple of lectures is reasons why we might actually see concerns for reputation disincentivize conflict. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.